Over to you. Thanks very much, Emma Jane. Uh, hi everybody, I'll turn on my camera quickly and give you a little wave. My name is Rob, I'm a learning technologist from the DCU Teaching Enhancement Unit in Dublin and my colleague Fiona is here with me as well. Hello, how are you all? Lovely to be here. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, using technology to support assessment design that supports academic integrity. And we're going to kick off, first of all, with a little VVox activity to get to know all of you guys. So let me just share my screen with you for a moment. And hopefully you should all see that now. You should be looking at a little VVox welcome window. Yes. And um, I'd like you to join the VVox session now by going to the website vvox.app and entering in the session code, which is 13240236. The instructions you can see there are on the screen. So you, if you have a phone beside you, um, that might be the easiest way to do it. With, with your phone, you could either scan the QR code as you see it on screen, or you can manually um, click to, or you go to the uh, VVox website, vvox.app, and enter in the ID code. So I'll just give you a moment to get connected to VVox. When you get connected, all you should see is a big, big DCU logo because uh, uh, we're just waiting to get started. Okay, I'll open the first question then on VVox. And the first question is just very simply, what best describes your role? So you can just tap the one that is most relevant to you, <clears throat> or indeed, if, if none of your roles are listed there, you can tap other. So most of us have responded there now, which is wonderful. So I will close off this poll now and we'll take a look at the results. I think most of us got the chance to respond there. Okay, excellent. So nearly half of us are in learning technology, um, followed closely by academic development. And some of us are teachers, tutors, lecturers, or academics. Uh, and some of us are other as well. So if you're an other, you might let us know in the Blackboard chat box what sort of role you have. Uh, but it seems that most of us here today are learning technologists, academic developers, or involved in, in, in teaching. Um, so that's wonderful. Thanks very much for that. If you can keep the VVox session open on your device, we will return later on throughout this presentation to uh, some more VVox polls. So if you could just leave VVox on, that would be great. But for the moment, I'm going to start sharing our slides and Fiona is going to um, kick off our presentation. Thanks for, oh, I saw them there a minute ago. No, oh, yeah. I'm just trying to share. Oop. Sorry. There we go. You should be able to. That's great. Thanks very much, Rob. Thank you. I'm just looking um, at um, Emma posted uh, the two items. I know uh, educational developers and technologists, uh, we no longer have two separate bits. Um, yeah, I think that's something that we could probably have a little chat about later on if we've time, because I agree with you. Although I guess some of us, for example, my role is academic developer and I work closely with Rob, who's a learning technologist. And I think I would be embarrassed to call myself a learning technologist beside Rob with his skill set. <laughs> so for me, the, the distinction is, is something that I appreciate at the moment. But yeah, we are all becoming more increasingly um technologically competent and um, particularly in this pivoted time or pandemic time. Anyway, you're all very welcome. Thank you uh, for the invitation to, to have a chat with you all today. 
I always uh, start any of these sort of assessment sessions with a quote from Bao, this quote from Bao, because I really like it. Um, just take a second to read it. And for me, that reminds, it reminds me all the time what assessment is about, because I sometimes get lost in the sort of technical aspects or the QA aspects of assessment and forget the absolute central role it has and the importance of it. And when I think about this quote, I think about the, the, the obligation we have as lecturers, as academics, to ensure our students can do what we say they will be able to do when they leave us. And one way of ensuring that is to reduce any chance that they have of cheating their way through it because then we're not doing them any, any uh, service at all. So our job is to try and design assessments that will promote academic integrity and help them to perform to a very high standard. Um, and this is a very tall ask and there's no one magic bullet that addresses it for us. We've done um, quite a bit of work in DCU, as have many other institutions over the last number of years. We've been involved in a, an Erasmus Plus project that ended in um, October last year, but we've continued a lot of our work in different projects. But as part of the work on the Erasmus project, we developed a suite of principles. And there are um, 12 principles that help academics design assessment that promotes academic integrity, recognizing that there's no one kind of silver bullet that sorts the problem out for us. So we broadly categorize them in terms of standards, uh, then the assessment design, and then student partnership or ownership. So I'm not going to go through each principle, just each category, and you can access those principles on our DCU website at any point, um, and also on the slides. Rob has popped the bit.ly link into the chat box. If you want to download the slides, you can get the, the hyperlinks then on them. Um, so if we start with the standards, really what we're saying in this kind of group um, of principles we're, we're trying to remind everybody in the university that we all have to aspire to these high standards, these high standards of academic integrity, and to think about it um, in the broader sense in terms of maybe ethical and moral values and beliefs, and to perhaps take out the values from our institution and dust them down again and remind ourselves that in the teaching, learning, and in this case assessment, we need to be espousing those values. And I think it's important that we commit um, as as, as uh, lecturers, we commit to upholding these high standards with our students um, and let them know that it's something we take very seriously for them because they want to be part of an institution that's recognised uh, for being an institution with high values, with high standards. And so as part of this kind of category of principles, we're asking um, academics to First of all, set those standards and commit to them and talk about the fact that they belong to an institution that has these high standards because they want to be proud of their institution also. And, you know, if we don't have these types of um, standards, we have anarchy. Um, and we saw an example of that in America recently uh, with Capitol Hill. And to just tell them that we're all committed to this in the university. And then in terms of standards, link and resource any support you can give to your students to try and help them reduce the risk of plagiarism and reduce the risk of cheating. So any, for example, in DCU we have, and I'm sure all the institutions have similar um, supports, you know, tutorials for students around citing and referencing, around writing, we have maths tutorials. So as many different resources as you can to reference um, and support your students don't expect them to know how to do this and don't expect them to know how to find information on how to do it. Um, so that's the kind of standards. The second suite of, um, I suppose, category of, of principles relate to the way we design our assessment. And we need to give a lot of consideration when we're designing our assessment to ways that we can, again, reduce the risk of the students going off and cheating. And some of those ways include rewarding them through the rubric. So calling it out in the rubric that you know 20% or 10% of the marks go for good housekeeping, which includes things like referencing, etc. The literature tells us that if we don't design assessments that motivate and challenge students, they get bored and they put it off, they procrastinate, and they tend then to resort to cheating. And so if we can motivate and challenge the students, primarily through authentic assessment, and we'll talk about that now in a moment, that's one way of engaging them and ensuring they're committed 
um, and they have agency in the assessment process. And of course, all the way through to scaffold the assessment when we're designing the assessment to scaffold it with formative feedback opportunities so that they don't get to the high risk summit of peace without getting loads of feedback from us um, and loads of opportunities for them to self-reflect or self-assess using rubric or peer assess. And we'll come to that when we look at the final um, category of principles, because that's student ownership and involvement. So just staying with the way we design assessment and having a look at a few examples. Um, authentic assessment is really, um, it's, it's found the literature tells it's a really good way to engage our learners. Um, they want to be doing something real. They want to have a tangible output from a piece of work. And that they can relate it to the real world, even if it's something they just converse um, at the dinner table with the family. Um, but they want to be able to show its relationship to the kind of the, the, the bigger the bigger picture and not just the module they're taking with us. Oh, I'm going to stop here for a moment, Rob, and pass back to you to do a VVox poll. Um, so we're just going to ask you in this next. Is that OK, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just want to get a sense of maybe some examples you might have of um, authentic ways of assessing your students. So what, what examples have you come across um, in your own experience or with colleagues that are very authentic ways of assessing our students? I might just jump back for a moment, Fiona, and reshare my screen, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you. But uh, for those of you who are still connected to um, the VFOX session, you should see a new question on your screen. And it's just asking you to give us a brief sentence of what you think authentic assessment looks like. So you can take a moment to um, complete that. I can see. Um, two of you have responded so far so we'll just give another moment for you to think this one might Super. take a little bit of thinking um you don't need to go into a lot of detail obviously you know one or two keywords is fine or just a brief little a brief little line of what you think authentic assessment might look like in your context um and for those of you obviously most of us here are learning technologists or, or academic developers or or may have mixed identities like 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 emma uh, very pertinently raised um so even if you're not within a particular discipline context yourself maybe there's a discipline that you work very closely with um or maybe you yourself are involved in teaching and learning or professional development so from whatever you know your, your context can be whatever you choose I suppose but but just tell us an example or two of of um, of what authentic assessment might might look like I think Fiona, may well be, sorry sorry Rob go on no no go ahead Fiona I was going to say it may well be your experience as a learner you might have had a, um, a very authentic experience as a learner that you'd like to share with us I was just going to say, Fiona, obviously, as, as an academic developer, you lead um, our module around um, uh, principles and practices uh, of, of teaching and learning for, for new tutors in yeah. DCU. And I think your assessment is, is, is quite authentic on, on that particular module. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, well then, as an example, while we're waiting for a few more to, to um, maybe contribute to the VVox poll, one part of the assessment is literally asking them to uh, critically evaluate an assessment strategy for a module they're working on. And so they have to sort of deconstruct every aspect of the assessment strategy and make recommendations. Or if it is a, a good example to kind of explain why it's good. So they have to look at things from constructive alignment to the rubric um, and, and its ability to assess the learning outcomes. Um, sca uh, uh, the scaffold at peace, so you know, integration of formative, um, and also that they have designed with academic integrity principles in mind. Um, so yeah, they go away with a, a brand new kind of assessment strategy. Mm. So it's very practical. It's not abstract at all. It's, it's 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 quite practical, situated in their own context and so on. And they share with each other during a work in progress session and they get an awful lot of feedback from each other because these are all practicing academics and so they're mm. able to give each other feedback um, in relation to their own experience. Excellent. Um, well, I, I think just over half of us have responded to the VVox poll, so I might I might close it off yes. there. Um, and yeah. let's just take Thank a look you. at let's just take a look at what you've said. Inviting students to approach questions from a range of different, yeah, that's a really good way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Thank you. 
playing a simulation game, I think they're brilliant. Yeah, anything role play, and again, we'll be talking about that in a minute. Presentation pitches and marketing, you know, they're really good examples. Proposed marketing plan for companies. Um, developing a poster, yeah, that you could submit to a conference. Fabulous, or even uh, writing an abstract or a, a paper. Um, that's always, I think, a really good way of getting students into that space. Um, we used to have an all-day group assessed. Oh, that's very good. Prioritize. I like that one, um, the all-day group assessed work sessions. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, will we open up mics now or wait till the end? What do you think, Rob? I don't mind. I, I mean, if anyone wants to wants to speak to any of these examples, please please feel free to come in on the mic. Um, clear examples. Yeah. I like that creating a podcast. Yeah, brilliant. Briefing papers. Yeah, some really good examples there. Video assessment. Thanks, Rob. That's great. And thank you all for contributing. Um, some very good examples there. And I'm going to talk through one or two other sort of things or projects we're doing in, in, in DCU that speak to this sort of authentic piece. Thank you. Um, we've been working over the last I suppose six months with Griffith University in Australia, and they have extensive experience using interactive orals. And they're based on that role play example that one of you talked about in the VVOX poll. Um, so an interactive oral is different than a, 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 um, a Viva in that it's a conversation. So you do have a role play element and it will be exactly that where you might uh, be invited. So for example, one colleague at the minute um, is teaching early literacy. And she has given the students the example of going into the staff room on their teaching placement experience to and the teachers that are already working in the school are really curious to know about um, early literacy interventions. And they're asking what's going on at the minute, what what are you reading, what's the new um, what are the new approaches to teaching literacy to, ch to children. And so the students have to explain this to um, some experienced teachers. The core elements of the interactive oral are a rubric and an exemplar. And so we have um, an exemplar where we create it with the academic and usually myself or, or somebody else in our community of practice. We create the, the kind of 15 minute video, um, an example of the, 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 the lecturer acting as a student and role playing. And then we give that exemplar to the students with the rubric and we ask them to grade the lecture. So they've great from doing that. They're very hard on their lectures, I have to say but it does give them um, a really good hands-on experience of it. And we have some examples in a, in a handbook um, that we've developed for the, for the, the um, I'm just looking for the link. I'll put it in the chat box after I've, fit, I've, after I've finished talking to you. But we have some examples of the exemplars and the corresponding um, rubric. So you can see that for yourselves and use it if you wish. Um, so just feedback from the students, they really seem to enjoy it. Um, like the positive feedback or what they enjoyed about it, like they liked the opportunity you gave them to work on kind of real life examples. And um, I suppose the negative was the time that it takes, but I think all assessments take that time and, and, and work. Um, this is an example from a project in um, Monash and Deakin University. It was a project that finished last year as well. It ran over a number of years. You might be familiar with it. The link to the uh, website is there. And they have some really good examples of scaffolded assessment. And this is just one. They've got six case studies uh, there. And each case study has this kind of um, diagram showing where the formative assessment and summative assessment is scaffolded across the assessment strategy. Um, and each of the six case studies have a short interview with the lecturer who designed them and then a kind of a very brief description of the assessment strategy but I just wanted you to see this looped and um, scaffolded assessment and you can see that it's not all the lecturer that's given feedback so a lot of times it's their peers that are giving them feedback they're self-assessing in some places um, here's the self-assessment and then finally the summative piece and the tutor gets involved in the assessment. Um, some other work we're doing uh, in DCU at the minute is around the student ownership or partnership piece, which is the final set of principles um, in, this, in these 12 principles. And again, the literature, these principles were informed by a, a comprehensive literature scoping review that was conducted as part of the Erasmus Plus project. 
And the literature tells us that if students are partners in the assessment strategy, they're far less likely to uh, cheat or to engage in, in, in misbehavior or any bad behavior because they're invested in it. They're part owners of it. Um, and as such, they have that sense of agency. So we received some small internal funding recently and we conducted a scoping review again and then we spoke with students and we spoke with uh, academic staff and we developed this diagram I know it's a little bit difficult to see so you can access it yourselves the link is there and um, as as a kind of a guide or a checklist if you like to remind lecturers how they might partner students and I and a lot of lecturers are doing it already but perhaps are not just calling it out so we wanted to let uh, lecturers know you know you can do sort of low level partnership if you're afraid to go into a high risk situation perhaps with first year students or um, maybe you're not experienced yourselves in partnering students so you don't want to go into say letting them do peer assessment at this early stage so this is sort of low level formative assessment and summative assessment opportunities and here you can see for example they're just things like negotiating submission dates or giving them choice and assessment briefs and then it becomes a, a little bit more high level um, in that you're asking them to peer evaluate each other's work or maybe co-design a rubric or peer evaluate, evaluate each other's work. Or um, you might give the students a kind of a generic feedback based on their rubric or their marking criteria, but the students can request feedback on a particular area, detailed feedback on a particular area, but they'd need to know where their uh, strengths and weaknesses are so they could take uh, advantage of that opportunity. And Rob is going to go into that in a little bit more detail when he talks about technology in a few minutes. Yeah, I saw one of you put peer feedback is useful. That's something that we have been doing a lot of in, in DCU. And that's an example of some work that I did with a colleague in the business school in DCU around um, using loss aversion. He was teaching uh, economics. And this was a summative peer assessment piece. And we used um, some of the functions in Moodle very effectively for this. We used the rubric in Moodle and the workshop function. So you can read a bit more about that if you're interested. Um, and this is just a piece of work. I think many of you would be familiar with it um, at this stage. It's kind of, uh, it's Tracy Brettock and colleagues, they, they conducted this uh, in Australia. And it's just to remind us uh, when and how students um, are less likely to cheat. So if there's a short turnaround time, they're more likely to cheat if it's a heavily weighted task. So you can see if we, get them involved in reflection or if we give them personalized or unique assessments or if they're part of a nested scaffolded approach to assessment and um, these are the ways that kind of promote academic integrity so it's sort of just I suppose um, reinforcing what I've been um, sharing with you already and this is just to say of course we can leverage technology but Rob is going to go into that now in a few in a bit more detail and finally before I pass over to Rob we have developed um, an academic in the hub on Moodle it's a self-paced professional development course for our, our academic staff to help them engage with some of these ideas and principles and give them examples of how they can use technology and Rob can talk a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes and just to remind you it's all based it's all based on this kind of extensive uh, literature review and we have our resources available there um, under Creative Commons license so feel free to use them uh, you can see with glossaries case studies scenarios etc uh, you can engage with that in your own time so the references, and I'm going to pass over to you, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thanks to everybody um, for participating in the VVox polls and for, um, oh, I think my internet might be acting up on me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes, Rob, we can. Sorry, excellent. You might give me a shout, Fiona, if my connection starts to go. I'm just getting a warning here. Uh, the joys of working from home. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks very much, Fiona, for taking us through that. You've set the scene nicely, talking about authentic assessment, talking about academic integrity, talking about assessment design. And now what I'd like to do in this half of the presentation is really to explore a few simple suggestions as to how technology can support uh, assessment design and I'll, I'll look at these suggestions in terms of each of the 12 principles that, that Fiona has, has mentioned um, and then towards the end really we'd like to 
you know hear from you about your own experience and, and we'd like to encourage you to um, add your suggestions or your examples to an open educational resource that we that we own most of you here are involved in the field of learning technology academic development teaching or or or, or somewhere in between or some amalgamation of all of those uh, different pieces of work so we very much see this presentation uh, as a toolkit for you when you're working with academics who are needing guidance and needing support that you can bring these tools to them uh, to offer them some suggestions and to offer them some some inspiration so that's why we've shared the direct link to the Google Slides with you because there are a lot of links built into the Google Slides so really we'd love for you to to take these slides afterwards make them your own use them um, with your own people in your in your own institutions there can often be a somewhat misguided misconception that um, technology is a great enabler of academic dishonesty and that technology is a is a great evil that makes it so much easier for students to plagiarize and to cheat and to collude and so on and unfortunately that i suppose there are some elements of that that are true but but i and and, and we in, in in dcu very much take the view that technology can really be a force for good and can really help you to support and embed academic integrity and in particular i like to think uh, uh, around how technology can offer efficiencies for the assessment process or for managing the assessment process can make things very efficient for staff and can make things very transparent for students you know if deadlines are all set up on your environment in advance if feedback is made readily available and uh, using appropriate VLE tools um, if students can kind of see the, 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 the stage of marking that their assessments are in all gives students and staff a window into the assessment process that I think is is quite useful uh, Fiona's already mentioned how it can provide opportunities for authentic assessment like the interactive oral she spoke about things like e-portfolios or the example Fiona used from her own module as well um, a great thing about technology that very often a lot of um, academics don't um, leverage is the opportunity for media enhanced feedback, audio feedback, video feedback can be so much more powerful for students than simply reading text uh, off a document or text on screen. Uh, media enhanced feedback can uh, allow students to the tone and the emotion of the feedback which can be quite important technology can allow us to scaffold the development of academically honest behaviors and we're going to go through a couple of those suggestions now in a moment um, and technology can really help involve students in the process as partners fiona alluded to some of the work that we've been doing in that space and, and i'm going to touch upon that shortly as well just obviously to acknowledge our current context like most institu institutions DCU is in a period of extended remote teaching due to the pandemic certainly you know from now until uh, the end of our academic year in June we'll, we'll be mostly doing online learning with our students remains to be seen uh, what happens in in September quite likely that there'll be uh, some elements of, of online teaching still remaining in in September unfortunately we in Ireland uh, uh, are not as good at vaccinating our population as our as our friends in the UK are uh, so that is no doubt going to have some impact on our teaching context in the next academic year but what we've seen in the current academic year is a really big shift to continuous assessment um, which is good uh, we you know we know continuous assessment is a preferable method of assessing students than say terminal examinations we also know students prefer continuous assessment over terminal examinations in in most cases um, and I do hope that that shift continues after the current academic year after the COVID uh, context I really hope we keep some of this good practice we still of course we still have some terminal examinations in the current context most of which are kind of open booked exams maybe open for a 24-hour period uh, and, and we do have some 
timed quizzes as well. Uh, but very interestingly, uh, traditionally, we in DC would have had a two week examination period um, in the winter and in the summer. And this winter, we've actually gone from a two week period to a one week period. So it shows you uh, the big, big shift to continuous assessment. Uh, and our staff have really, really engaged very well with assessment planning during this current context. Um, the continuous assessment is largely continuous, you know, the, it, it's not just a sort of a, a, an end of semester essay, but they are building in regular assessment activities for students throughout the semester, sort of, you know, getting into that assessment for learning space and uh, assessment as a means of student engagement. We don't currently use proctoring tools in, in DCU. Um, uh, that is a, a, a highly controversial um, area and, and uh, I don't want to get too much into it because I think I think this is often the problem with conversations around academic integrity and technology that it seems to always just drift towards talking about proctoring and text matching and really you know our philosophy in DCU is around using to support the assessment design that will in itself promote good academic integrity. Um, so we don't use proctor tools. Personally speaking, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a fan and I, I've been quite worried about a lot of the coverage and, uh, of, of proctor and tools and light about them in recent times. Um, but it remains to be seen, obviously, what happens in, in, in that space. We do have Urkund as our text matching tool. Uh, we use that on our Moodle VLE, but we largely try to promote the use of Urkund as a formative feedback uh, exercise for students. You know, we, we try not to create the uh, impression that uh, the Urkund text matching tool is a sort of a policing tool or a catch-all tool. Um, it can be used in that way, but in the first instance, we really try and, and and, and, and uh, promote it as a, as a formative feedback tool for students. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing uh, from, from your own institutions, do, do some of you have a, a similar context as us? Uh, and if you do, you might let us know in the chat, please, and we can, we can pick that up towards the end. Um, the student perspective is hugely important in, in, in everything we do, and Fiona alluded to this as well, and, and we're very, very lucky in, in the Teaching Enhancement Unit in DCU that we get the opportunity to work with students very regularly. Uh, we have a, a new portfolio initiative that involves students. I'm involved in a sectoral project called Enhancing Digital Teaching and Learning, and we have a whole team of student interns on that, and they're just absolutely fantastic. And then our, our Student as Partners project um, saw us working with students students as well. And we have an agency in, in Ireland called the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. Um, and they have a student associate intern then believe well at the moment. So we, we interface quite a lot with those. And working with these interns, working with focus groups over time, we really do try and tease out the student perspective on assessment. Um, and students, you know, what we keep hearing time and time again is they don't intend to cheat or plagiarise. They really want to be engaged by meaningful assessment. And uh, they want to be supported in engaging in assessment uh, as well. So I think the question we should be asking ourselves all the time is how can technology help this? Not how can technology help uh, identify plagiarism? How can technology catch students out? No, how can technology help engage the students in meaningful assessment? I think that's really the question we should be, uh, that should be at the forefront of our minds. Um, you can have a, explore those links in, in, in your own time. Uh, we, we conducted a, a literature review uh, as part of our students as partners project. And what was actually what was really interesting about the literature review, it, it looked at articles, I think, spanning the last 20 years. Um, and um, what came out was actually a lot of great practical examples of how technology supports student partnership. We were looking for a technology angle that, that wasn't something we were expecting to find but in the literature we actually found lots of great examples of how technology was being used to support student partnership in assessment uh, so do take a look at the literature review in your, in your own time because it will give you um, those 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 important examples
but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of move on and just do a sort of a whistle stop tour of the 12 principles, um, as you can see on screen, and how technology can support the implementation of them. And they are really simple suggestions. You know, again, people seem to think that um, academic integrity requires this gargantuan effort or this this you know a uh, large initiative to 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 tackle um but it's it, it it's not that black and white uh, i don't think uh, you, you probably agree with me feeling but really the best way to embed academic integrity is just simple scaffolded uh, approaches working with your students um and that's really what i suppose we want to you to walk away with from this uh, webinar is having those simple suggestions in your toolbox so when when you're working with students if you're if you're involved in a teaching role or when you're working with with academics and, and helping academics that you can draw on this toolbox um, so the first tip that we are going to give you is uh, oh actually before I move on I, I will just say that uh, we're a, we're a Moodle user in in DCU and I'm not sure how many Moodle uh, institutions we have here you can you can let me know in the chat what your what your VLE of choice is uh, but if any of you are, are Moodle users um, we do have a playlist on our YouTube channel uh, for each one of these um, tips that I'm going to go through now uh, so you can see them in in more detail and, and how to do them and again that playlist of videos might be a useful thing to put in your toolbox for when you're working with academics uh, so our first tip is around displaying standards and policy on your VLE page. Uh, Fiona alluded to this earlier. This might be something we do already. We might have built into our VLE templates that there's a link to, you know, the institution's um, uh, plagiarism policy and so on. Um, but if we're not doing that, we, we might consider doing it. Uh, and if we are doing it, um, I think it's important to make sure that we templates each year to make sure they're still updated you know for example a few years ago we might have added the the the, the plagiarism policy that was current at that point in time to your template but perhaps there's been uh, an update since and therefore you need to update your uh, your your vle template so that's that's worth bearing in mind and then very related to that is you know we need to be able to it it, it it's it's I don't think it's good enough to just simply put a, a link to the policy on your page or, or tell students that there are these important uh, standards and important policies they have to adhere to. We have to help students adhere to, to those standards. We have to help them adhere to the policy. So in addition to your policies uh, on your page, also consider linking to um, resources and to supports that can help students develop uh, academically honest behavior. So your library might have good resources around citing, referencing, searching. Uh, you might have a student writing centre. We have a great student writing centre in DCU. And they provide great support for students around how to structure an argument and how to paraphrase and how to draw on literature, etc. So consider placing, um, you know, helpful how-to information on your, on your VLE page as well. Um, this is a biggie, and uh, unfortunately, there's 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 no magic bullet that's going to, uh, you know, rewrite your assessments every year, um, and and it does take time, and obviously that's why a lot of academics tend to uh, recycle assessments year after year. But students know when assessments are being recycled, and and they know uh, that they're not current, and they're more likely to to cheat or collude a, as a result. So perhaps when you're setting up your VLE each year, um, you could think about setting your importing settings so that you leave off last year's assessments. Um, and that way then that'll help prompt you to, to, to redesign your assessment because you're, 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 you're choosing not to carry it forward into the next academic year. Um, Fiona alluded to this already as well, the importance of grading forms, the importance of rubrics and so on, uh, having clear rubrics for students when it comes to their assessment. But it's important that those are shared with students in advance and, and most of our VLEs, as you can see there on screen, um, support embedded uh, 
forms on screen. Um, and I think it's really useful to take whatever rubric or marking scheme you have, embed it in your VLE so that it's accessible all the time to students. They can go and they can they can see it in advance when they're uh, about to start an assessment. Uh, and it just makes it much more transparent for students to access rather than, for example, having uh, you know different Word documents or different PDF files with the marking schemes contained within them. Consider using the built-in tools in your VLE because it just makes it a bit more easy for students to access. Um, it's very important as well uh, that students are are motivated to um, participate in 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 assessment um, and a way of doing that is you know for example designing assessment tasks or uh, designing parts of an assessment that challenge the students to do the work themselves uh, you know perhaps using something like a uh, a glossary tool on Moodle or a wiki on one of the other um, VLEs and inviting students, you know, giving students a deadline, getting them to do it, letting them know that it's visible and accessible to everyone else in the in their cohort. So therefore, they'll be more motivated to get the work done, get the task in on time because it's a collaborative effort and it's it's visible to all. So they're motivated to get it done quite quickly. And again, you know, we have the tools available, and it's a question really of just using them uh, in, in a way that supports that motivation of students. Um, uh, another way, again, to keep your assessments up to date and authentic and relevant is, is perhaps to give different, uh, you could possibly use a, the, the same or, or a similar assessment approach each year, but each year you update um, topics uh, or, or, you know, and, and let students choose the particular relevant current topic that they want to avail of. Um, so, for example, you know, if you're um, if you're teaching politics at the moment and uh, what you might do is you might have a question that's around analysing, you know, political discourses, uh, but each year you update your um, your topic so that it, it, it draws on, on a current political issue and you know that can be really engaging for students they they can see that it's uh, relevant they can see that it's current um, and it, it can be more interesting rather than examining some sort of historical uh, uh, political issue um, if that's uh, of course appropriate for your module uh, I've mentioned this already. Um, text matching, using it as a as a, uh, a formative tool, and I can see. I think it was um, Emma that's mentioned it in the chat as well. Uh, using Turnitin for 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 checking in the in a formative sense for students, uh, and I think that's really really important. And we should uh, try and encourage our academics to see our text matching tools as helpful tools, not as merely uh, investigative tools. Uh, Open-ended solutions to assessments are, 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 are another good way of promoting academic integrity because it means there is no one correct answer. So therefore, it's very difficult for students to collude with, with other students uh, from, from previous cohorts. Uh, it's very difficult for them to uh, uh, plagiarise, etc. But uh, when working with open-ended uh, assessments, it is important that students are scaffolded to um, develop their own open-ended solution. And again, we have great tools on our VLEs that um, uh, enable students to um, share their thinking with their lecturer, share the development of their open-ended solution and, and for the lecturer to help um, help the students develop that a bit further. So the lecturer and the student working together on the VLE to, to scaffold development of, of a solution. Um, Recording uh, a student's own individual way of thinking uh, is another great way um, to embed academic integrity because it forces the students to explain what were they thinking with their assessment? Why did they do what they did? What was their justification for it? What were they thinking at the time? By its nature, that's going to be very individual. It's going to be very personalized. It's going to be very difficult for students to cheat or plagiarize their way out of that. So think about using e-portfolios, blogs, journals, etc that students complete alongside their assessment in, in which they're evidencing their, their pathway of thinking. Um, and, and similarly, again, um, 
if students are making choices around assessment topics, consider allowing students to place themselves into their own groups and each group is based around an assessment topic. So if you're um, uh, you know, a lecturer in um, um, literature, for example, you know, you might have uh, chosen a couple of different texts uh, that students need to complete their assessment on. And if they, they choose a particular text, they go into that group for that text. And then perhaps they are on the basis of their group membership. They have some sort of gated, gated access to material uh, or supports related to that particular assessment topic. So it makes things a bit more personalized and a bit more meaningful uh, for the students while still being supportive uh, uh, in, in terms of them completing their assessment. Um, this is this principle is, is, is quite similar to what Fiona is about, about the interactive oral assessment, which is, I suppose, building in a sort of a defence type component to an assessment. So that if a student is submitting an essay or a case study or a poster or whatever, that they also upload a short audi audio clip alongside their work in which they're defending their work. Um, and this can be really, really powerful. It's relatively simple to do on our VLEs, but can be quite powerful for the students because it's helping them to, to, to build the skill to be able to defend their work, to explain their actions, uh, and I suppose to synthesize their assessment into a short uh, audio format uh, in order to uh, defend what they've done. Um, and and this, is a, a, this is one of the tips I really like, like the most because it's, uh, it's a good skill that students will develop for, for future students as well as they go into more senior years of their degree or they go on to pursue postgraduate studies. Uh, and then lastly, um, and this is where things get kind of really, really uh, powerful in terms of academic integrity, is where you're involving students in the process itself, inviting students in to co-design assessments with academics. Uh, and that could be co-design, uh, co-designing a rubric, co-designing uh, uh, an assessment brief, um, co-curating uh, topics or, or, or choices for the assessment. Um, uh, it can be a bit daunting, I think, when when lecturers are are are, are approached with this idea of, of student partnership because it seems like a mammoth task. There's one of me, the lecturer, and there could be a hundred or more of the of the students. Uh, but using things like a discussion forum on your VLE can be really really handy for managing discussion, managing the co-design process. You know, giving every student a voice, but you as the lecturer still being able to kind of control um, the phases of it. So so it doesn't sort of uh, burgeon out of out of control. Um, if you're interested uh, in particular uh, for the last three principles, principle 12, 11 and 10, uh, the Sapia work that we've done in DC will be of particular interest. And I saw Fiona popped the, the link in the chat to that earlier. Um, so thank you very much for that, Fiona. Um, so for one last time, it's going to be over to you guys, to VVox, um, where we're just going to ask you one more final question uh, based on these 12 little suggestions that I've gone through. Um, so if you want to return to your VVox screen, wherever you have it uh, open, uh, you will see a new question on your screen. It's a multiple choice question. Um, and it uh, is just simply asking you out of the, the 12 uh, tips that I went through just now, um, what do you think you will uh, use or incorporate? Um, so you can select up to 12. So if all 12 of them tickle your fancy, uh, you're, you're very welcome to select all 12 on your on your VVox uh, interface. Uh, or if there's just a few that particularly interest you, um, you can you can just choose those ones as well. Uh, if you've disconnected from VVox, uh, again, the instructions now are, are, are on screen. Uh, you can go to the web at, at vvox.app and enter in the, the nine digit code. So I'll give you a moment to um, respond to that poll. Um, and I could see that the chat box was hopping during during the last uh, few minutes. And I apologize, I didn't get to it all, but I'm not sure, Fiona, did you see anything of interest in the in the chat box? Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, mainly, I think, sort of networking and support and help. Um, Emma's been sharing lots of resources and examples with Gustavo, as has Gustavo. So, 
I don't think there's any outstanding questions. More sharing examples is a really nice example that Emma shared around um, preparing students to use the rubric. So, you know, start Excellent. introducing it at a kind of low level, I guess, um, because, um, yeah, they don't always know how to, that, that it's to develop the assessment lit literacy, I guess. Emma, feel free to take the mic if you want to add to that. No, I mean, I'll, it was the actual assessment because um, when I used to teach, I was down at Portsmouth and that was in an educational um, technology module. So I was really stressing to them that if they were thinking of teaching people, they were jolly well going to have to know how to write a rubric. And that kind of helped to sell it. Um, I think, although they said, you know, also wish we'd done this in year one. I think it would have been much, much harder to really get them to engage and to really explain why it was important. Because quite often, I think those sorts of things, it's not until you've done it that you realise the benefit. That's um, so that was a kind of a really good way in. But it, it took quite a lot of um, time. But I guess, I mean, a lot of the ideas we've come up with. I've never been very keen on the formal exam, even though I was a student at school who would far rather do an exam than a bit of coursework. But I realise that for many people, um, it's it's actually much more beneficial um, than just coming for an exam. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's very little authentic about exams unless maybe you're preparing to go into maybe the professional side where they examine you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, other than that, I can't see why yeah. exam. But anyway, we, we're still in the minority. I'm working on a group, a national group around academic integrity, and there's a subgroup being assembled to uh, evaluate proctored exams. It's just heartbreaking to see resources going into that space. You just want to go, stop wasting time looking into that and find other alternative ways of authentically assessing. I, I fully agree. I mean, I think proctoring is, is I just can't bear the thought of it. I basically, they're out of Yeah. Yes. But we do have I'll some people. Look, and I think, I think, I think. Sorry, go ahead, Emma. I was going to say, I think we do have some people across the university that are getting pressure from um, professional bodies who. So I think possibly it's work that we really need to be doing with the professional bodies to get them to understand the dangers of proctoring um, rather than universities making that choice. I've stopped talking now. Sorry, I think I'm getting a bit of a bit of a delay on my on my internet connection over here. Uh, we have we have come to the end, and 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 I don't want to I don't want to disturb the conversation. But you can just see very clearly on screen there, uh, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, uh, finding these these tips useful. Uh, things like the uh, you know letting students record their individual pathway of thinking, students uploading audio defense and, and lots of other uh, suggestions resonating with people which is which is great to see and this this uh, you know this kind of flies in the face of, of 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 the people who are calling for for proctoring you know there are ways of using technology to support academic integrity there are ways of making assessment incredibly meaningful and engaging for students and i think it's much better to invest in um you know promoting the, uh, this kind of message and advocating these kinds of approaches rather than investing our time and our resources into proctoring um and emma you're you're dead right perhaps it's the professional bodies we need to be having these conversations with not just our, our universities and our and our lecturers and our managers and so on Um, so very lastly, I'm just going to. Uh, there's been some some good examples in the um, in in the discussion and in the chat. And what I would love for you to do is, and we will leave you on this point. Um, we have an open educational resource of some exemplar exemplars and case studies of technology enhanced assessment. A lot of really really great examples of of ways people have used technology to create you know engaging, interesting, exciting, uh, authentic assessments. Um, so that OER there is available for you and available for the people you work with as you know another tool in this toolbox. Uh, but if any of you have your own examples of um, 
uh, ways you've used technology to support academic integrity. You know, we'd love if you'd add it to the OER as well. And you can see a link on the screen there to um, add uh, uh, your own examples to to the OER. Uh, it'd be wonderful if you'd if if you'd take some time to do that. And of course, you can contact us if you if you have any questions. Um, but I think we will. Oh, there's also a checklist you can download again. You know, you can use the slides afterwards and and download that. That's a very handy. Uh, checklist for, for, for lecturers to prompt them to think about academic integrity uh, and assessment design. Um, so that's that's it from us. I'll pop the link in again to the to the slides so that uh, you have them. And please do work through the slides and please do share the slides with others. Lots of useful links in them. Uh, and this can be you know part of your 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 toolbox around um, academic integrity. So I think that brings us to the end and we'd love to continue the, 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 the conversation. If anyone has any, any questions or, or, or comments, feel free to jump in on the mic. Is that the best way to do it, Fiona? I think so, yeah. Um, they're, they're using chat boxes as well. So whichever, yeah, if anyone would like to add anything, any ideas, observations or questions, please do so now by taking the mic. I think we're coming between them all and their lunch, Rob. Yes, I think so. Yes, absolutely. And we, we do not want to get between people and their lunch. <laughs> well, if um, I would just like to get everybody then, if we can, to put our hands together and say a huge thank you to Fiona and Rob. That was an absolutely brilliant session. Thank you so much. I don't know if I normally use a nice little clap emoji. I do like the clap emoji. I think it's brilliant. But thank you ever so much. I'm going to stop the recording now.